Hi everyone, I'm Sam Valenti, and today I am speaking with a former longtime sports writer and editor for the Kenosha News, current Kenosha.com contributor. He works in the scoreboard ops for the Chicago White Sox and is a notable personality on White Sox Twitter. He posts great Sox coverage and nuggets. It's the Sox nerd himself, Dave Marin. Dave, how are you doing today? Wonderful. Thank you for having me. I appreciate being here. It, well, hey, it's a real honor to be speaking with, with you, you know, someone Thank who's had you. such a long, you, you know, and great journalism career and, you know, and is still churning out great content to this day. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate that. It's a labor of love. Yep, absolutely. You know, I'm curious, you know, what was your first exposure to sports as a kid? Wow. Uh, well, I don't remember this, but my mother uh, often talked to me about how I would sit in front of the television as a as a boy growing up in Chicago, and I would watch the games, and I would describe what was going on in the games, essentially doing radio play-by-play and analysis. And from there, it just morphed into a love of sports. I watched a lot of Cubs games. a lot. Of, I grew up in suburban Chicago, so I watched a lot of Sox games, Cubs games. I mean, everything. It was a perfect place to grow up because there was every sport. I was exposed to every major sport. And also I was exposed to uh, every major form of media, radio. Radio was big back then, uh, TV and newspapers. So that's how I got. And then I was, that's how I got started. I was also extremely fortunate to grow up literally from my front yard in my home in Wilmette, Illinois. I could see the Northwestern University athletic facilities. Um, I, the baseball facility was literally right at the end of my block. And then there was McGaw Hall, which is where the basketball team now plays. And then Dyke Stadium, Welsh, uh, Ryan Field. And I spent a ton of time there watching games. Um, uh, then I covered a few games, but going to practices. And that's kind of how I, I really helped me um, with my love of sports. And then when I got older, my parents, God bless them, would let me take the train to the games uh, in, from Chicago, uh, from Wilmette to Chicago. I started doing that when I was 12. And then I got into media in high school and college, and then I made it my career. So basically, I started as a very young boy just following sports and just pursuing that. Ooh. That's how it started. Wow, wow. wow, that's great. And as you mentioned, <laughs> as you were just mentioning, you know, you've got – a lot of great and valuable experience in high school. Uh, uh, you know, would you mind talking a bit about that? Not at all. Um, I was very fortunate to go to a high school in suburban Chicago, uh, New Trier High School. And um, it's always ranked as one of the best public high schools in the country. And there you are afforded any opportunity you want. They have clubs for everything. They have activities for everything. <clears throat> They had a newspaper that came out every Friday. So when you're a junior and senior in high school, you can write for the paper. And that's what I did. But as a freshman, I started on the radio station. Nutria High School in Winnetka, Illinois, had a 10 watt over the air radio station. So literally from the first day, I, uh, the first time they had an organizational meeting there as, as I was a, when I was a freshman, I signed up. I got to go on the air and do play by play. I did a radio show. I just took advantage of all those opportunities. <clears throat> so I was very into radio at Nutrier. And uh, my freshman year, I was play-by-play. -play, and then I became sports director for two years. And then my, my senior year, I was station manager. Um, so I was very privileged and um, very. I took advantage of that. Um, and that really taught me a lot. I was able to get a lot of real-life experiences in high school which at the time, you know, you don't think about it because you're in high school. I'm sure the same has happened to you, but you're just thinking like, looking back, you cannot believe that I had that opportunity to do that. And I'm so glad I took advantage of it. So high school, yes, was a very, very important jumping off part for my uh, career, more so on radio than um, TV. When I was growing up, I wanted to be a play-by-play -play guy, but I later pursued print journalism. Wow, 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 man! You know, I think that's, I think that's so cool that you were able to get to get that great experience. You know, you know, at such an early age, you know, yeah. I, think that's, I think that I think that's amazing. Very lucky, and um, you know, that was one of the things that I did. Um, my mother 
made me go to the first organizational meeting because of what I just told you. You know, she's seen me since I was six years old, five years old, just babbling about sports. And she she thought I would be best suited in the rate in doing that. And she was 100 percent correct. Very lucky. Yeah, yeah, of course. And then, you know, how, so then then you were at New Trier, but then you go to Marquette. So how did you decide on Marquette? as the place that you wanted to go to college? Um, Marquette University, extremely close to my home. Uh, Milwaukee and uh, suburban Chicago are very close. And that played a big, big part in it. I wanted to go away to school, but I, I didn't want to go away too far. Number two, the one of the biggest um, uh, needs for me, wants that I wanted when I was going to college was I wanted to go to school in an urban setting. I did not want to go to a college town. And... Um, and then I wanted a, a good journalism program. I went up to Marquette my second semester of my sophomore year at New Trier. And I saw it. I saw the facilities. I fell in love with it. And that's basically where I wanted to go. Um, so by the time I was 15 years old, I knew I wanted to go to Marquette. And I got in, luckily, a little bit of a struggle. Kids, do your homework. Mm-hmm. And uh, I got in there and... Again, just like New Trier, it afforded me a lot of opportunities right away, and I jumped into those opportunities. I took advantage of them, and you know, my freshman year, I was a beat writer for the Marquette Tribune on the club football team, and then my sophomore and junior years, I was uh, I was assistant sports editor and then co sports editor my junior year, and then my senior year, I I, w- I just wrote for the paper. Um, Yes, Marquette really, just like New Trier, it afforded me the opportunity to get started on my career early on. Other schools respected journalism schools, no question. Uh, Missouri's for, is one. You had to wait two years to get into the College of Journalism. I don't know if that's still true, but it was back then. And I just didn't want to wait two years. I wanted to get going on my journalism career right away. I didn't want to take the chance that maybe my grades wouldn't be good enough or whatever. And so... Marquette, because it afforded me the opportunity to get going right away, that's where I went and I took advantage of it. And it was one of the best things I ever did. Well, it certainly sounds like you made a good decision to go. Yeah, I did. Also, I met my wife there, which is the most important thing that happened oh, at Marquette that's... University. Oh, that's and great. We're... And I was working on the newspaper and uh, you know, we both met on the newspaper there. So, yeah, that was the most important thing. No question about it. No, yeah, 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 of course, you know, and then, then, and then just, you know, what was it like, like, well, like, 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 I guess the media stuff, you know, what was it like in Marquette, I guess, compared to what you had in high school? Uh, that's a great question. <clears throat> the radio facilities at my high school were years ahead of what Marquette had. Really? Uh, Marquette was basically just a radio station that broadcast only to the dorms. It was not an over the air radio station. It was legit. You were still doing radio shows. You were still doing, uh, I did some sports, um, did some Marquette basketball games, which was extremely cool. But uh, the but then the newspaper facilities at, at Marquette University were top notch. Um, Nutria was a, you know, a weekly high school paper where you did a lot of the things that you did as a pro in, in college. But at, at Marquette, you've got, it was a, it was a daily paper. The paper came out um four days a week and you were learning how to be <clears throat> in the da- in the daily newspaper world and that was very important you were working on deadlines you were managing your time you were writing stories you were laying out pages you were signing stories and that was an unbelievable and, and they're like they're, and I learned to function in the newsroom setting which was um I won't say more valuable because you don't want to downgrade any kind of education you got, but it was as valuable as any education I got in the classrooms at Marquette. So um, from a radio standpoint, high school was superior. <clears throat> from a newspaper standpoint, college was much more superior. And that's why I decided ultimately to pursue a print journalism career as opposed to a broadcast career. I majored in journalism at Marquette University, print journalism. I graduated I have a degree in journalism from Marquette University and the College of Journalism, which no longer exists. It's merged into a couple of other schools. But that was that played a huge role in in the quality of newspaper facilities as opposed to the radio. 
Right. And, 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 you know, so you go down the, you know, the print journalism route. And of course you worked with Kenosha news, you know, for many, many years, you had a great, amazing career there, you know, now, how did you first get involved with, with uh, them? My senior year at, at Marquette university, there's a job board and uh, on the job board, this is what, this is before the internet. This was 1987. Um, there was a job posting <clears throat> for, the Kenosha News, um, which is Kenosha is literally halfway between Chicago and Milwaukee. <clears throat> so I ended up applying for the job here it was a sports writing job. Um, Kenosha was at that point adding a Saturday paper. They were a six day a week paper afternoon. And so they were adding a uh, Saturday paper. They needed another sports writer. I, I applied for the job and I got it and I started working there um uh, the 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 week before i graduated from from high school may of 1987 and um i started there and i worked at the kenosha news from may of 1987 until november of 2016 and in between i did everything and you know there is <clears throat> some uh there's a lot of value to working for a big city paper a big city but at the at the smaller paper, I did everything. I learned everything. I learned how to deal with people. I wrote, I covered every kind of sport imaginable. Um, I learned to to send stories from the remotest possible uh, places. And um, I basically survived. And I think from a um, interesting point of view, I think I survived longer in the world of journalism at my paper because I think the the local smaller papers hung on to their staff longer. I don't know if this is true. I just felt this way. And so while the, the industry was shrinking, it took longer for the <clears throat> local papers to uh, shrink. And eventually that did happen to me. Right. And, and uh, you, you know, I'm just curious, what, like, what was it like for you, just a typical day in the newsroom at, uh, in Kenosha? Well, um, I became sports editor in 1995. Um, so as a sports writer, I basically would go in and I would work on the production of the paper. We had a small staff and I would do any assignments that were given to me by the editor. When I became sports editor, that was in 1995, I basically was in charge of the entire section. So what I would do is <clears throat> I would map out every day what would be in the paper that day. And then I would make sure that the people that were working for me, executed that plan. Um, so I basically would decide where stories went, who was going to what store, uh, what events, what features would be um, written, what columns would be written, <clears throat> what teams, you know, what, what games we would put in the paper, things along those lines. And we all had to do that in, in um, on deadline. Um, on a much broader sense, you know, I decided, you know, how the paper would look, um, what people would do, um, what hours people would work. And um, uh, and then and I had to operate within the management team of the newsroom at that point. So again, I did a lot of everything when I was at the Kenosha News and it was a great, great experience. And, you know, now I don't know if this is true anymore. I mean, I was able to build a life on journalism. I was able to move to Kenosha buy a house and raise a family and retire. And I don't think that's <clears throat> happening much anymore in journalism. I hope it is, but um, I really got a lot out of my time at the Kenosha news. No question about it. Well, 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 well like that, that, I think, I think that's so great that you, that, that you had such a, you know, long, amazing career there and, you know, and thank and you obviously made a ton of great memories uh, in the process. Yeah. <clears throat> and I, I'll tell you what, too, what, what, did it for me was I had an unbelievable staff that worked for me. Sports writers that could work at any market in the country, no question about it. They were good. They were good to me. They were fun. <clears throat> and what really is gratifying to me now, Sam, is that they still keep in touch with me. I was their boss. You know, I was working them hard. I was giving them stuff to do that they probably didn't want to do. We worked nights. We worked weekends. We worked holidays. You know, we worked past midnight, but 
but they still keep in touch with me, which really means a lot to me. And it was a good staff. Um, a couple of them are working at Kenosha.com, which you mentioned. Um, I married one of them. <laughs> Lori, Lori, my wife, Laura, worked for me. And then there are other, another guy retired, and then others have moved on. One became a mayor of a town in Milwaukee, uh, South Milwaukee. So I'm, I've been, I was really lucky. And if I could give anyone advice, surround yourself with good people. That's the number one rule of journalism, if you ask me. Yep, that 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 is some great advice. You yeah. know, you know, because it's really important. You know, you know, especially you know, you know, in the journalism business, to be yes. To 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 surround yourself, you know, with people with good people and people that yep. you can trust. And I had the best, and they were very good. And as I said, I still keep in touch with them. A lot of us are Marquette University basketball fans, so we've had a lot of good stuff to talk about lately. Oh 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 yeah, definitely. Yep, you got that right. Now now obviously, you know, we got to talk about you know your your long you know no you know your your long uh, you know many many great years you've had uh, you know with the White Sox. I believe you. Got first got involved with them in '84. Uh, yeah, do you mind telling kind of the story of how you started working with the Sox? Yeah, uh, my freshman year at Marquette University, the the summer after my senior year at New Trier, and the, my freshman year at Marquette, I was packing dishes for work, and I didn't want to do that anymore. So summer work, <clears throat> holiday work. So what I did was I wrote a letter to every um, team in Chicago, uh, Bears, Bulls, Blackhawks, Cubs, Sox, Sting was a soccer team, everyone wanting a summer, summer internship. The only team that wrote back favorably were the White Sox. And I, and I was a big Cub fan at that time, <clears throat> but the White Sox wrote back and they said, we have this marketing opportunity in the marketing department. Um, so I went down and I interviewed for it on spring break of my freshman year. And I interviewed with a woman who's still there, Christine O'Reilly. And they claimed they were really nice. They said, I got the job. I couldn't accept it because I had to finish out my year at Marquette university. The white Sox wanted someone to start understandably right away on opening day. So, but they forward, they were kind enough to forward my name to the scoreboard department, which was hiring and had a much more flexible schedule. So I was hired by a woman by the name of Liz Burke to work in the scoreboard. And that was uh, my, my first day of work for the Chicago White Sox was April 1st, 1984. And I started to work in the department of scoreboard operations at the old park, old Comiskey park. And uh, I worked there from in 1984, 1985, 1986, and part of 1987. When I got the job with the Kenosha news, I didn't think I would be able to handle both jobs. So I stopped my employment at the Chicago White Sox. I did not work there in the 88 or 89 season. In 1990, Jeff Chanel, for whom I still work, and is one of the great giants of this industry, he's in the scoreboard hall of fame, and he should be. <clears throat> he became full-time scoreboard operator, and he asked if I would return. And I said, of course. So I returned. So I, I've been working there continuously every year since 1990. And... My job with the White Sox is I research, display graphics on each player uh, home and away during games, and I research trivia and interesting factoids that are also displayed uh, on the scoreboards during the game. And it's a great job. Great is really not an adequate word to describe that job. You know, I'm, I'm perched up behind home plate, and I'm watching the game, and I'm displaying information on the scoreboard <clears throat> as the game goes on. And then my trivia is used and my notes are used. And um, it's just a fantastic job. I've been there since 1990, continuously, as I said. And I work with some great people. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's a wonderful, wonderful job. <clears throat> and uh, as I said, I work with some great people. And that, again, surround yourself with great people. And I'm part of this great crew, talented and essentially, it's like a closed circuit TV uh, show, and I'm part of it. I'm the graphics part. Of it. <clears throat> man, 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 that that that's so cool. And I think I think it's kind of interesting that that, that actually you know before working with the Sox, you know, you were more of a Cubs fan, and then I was. I grew up on the north side of Chicago, uh, the northern sub the, the northern suburbs of Chicago, well met, and um, 
the Cubs were very popular at the time, and I was a Cub fan. But <clears throat> as my work increased with the White Sox, I became obviously more and more of a of a White Sox fan, and I really don't have much use for the Cubs right now. Um, but yeah, that's how it that's how it became, and I'm just you know totally into the White Sox. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, I mean, once you've worked with the team for so many years, I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, you, I mean, you can't really go back to the Cubs after that. No, no, no not at all. <laughs> And, and and you know and, and as you mentioned you, you, you know I think it's interesting interesting that, that that the year that you kind of went back to the White Sox I believe that that, that was like that was like might might have been like the last season it was Missy. yeah Jeff was hired um to be full-time uh, scoreboard operator and and take us into the new park the next year so I was lucky enough to be there for the last year at old Comiskey Park and it was that that year was magical. That there's a documentary out about it. It's called Last Comiskey. It's on YouTube. I would encourage <clears throat> anyone to watch that. I'm I do I'm in that a little bit. Yep. Um, and you just learn like that park was just fantastic. It was great. It was a great atmosphere. It was a great old park. And then that season was just fantastic. So yeah, that year was really special. That was a fun year. It was almost as fun as the year they won it in 2005. Yeah, it's it's funny you bring that up because I, I watched like the first part of it uh, last night. Yeah, YouTube. I'm glad you watched that. It's really well done, and it was a labor of love by those those two gentlemen. Uh, they're not making any money off of it, and it's just it's so great. It is really great. Yeah, yeah. It's I mean, I mean, it's just really well made. You know, I love seeing all this stuff with Nancy with the uh, Nancy Faust in it. Yeah, uh, wonderful. It was wonderful. It was really great. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, what was the experience like, you know, working there at Old Comiskey as opposed to, you know, what is there you know, now with Guaranteed Rate Field? Uh, Old Comiskey Park, you know, was built in 1910 <clears throat> and uh, there wasn't obviously TV or radio back then. So um, it wasn't built to handle electronics or maybe even electricity. Right. Very limited. So basically, uh we were just shoehorned <clears throat> at the old park, shoehorned into it like a TV studio. It was a two level TV studio that was built, I think probably in the early eighties. And, you know, the, the, they had to work around the park. I, I assume in building that, well, when we moved to the new park, we basically got this whole control room and the control room was built in the park. So it's a lot more technologically advanced. <clears throat> um, the view, my view is pretty much the same. I mean, when I was at the old park, I was a little bit higher, um, but I could, it was right behind home plate. And at the new park, I'm essentially right behind home plate as well. So um, the Comiskey Park, you know, it had a lot more, uh, it, you know, guaranteed rate field has its own character, you know, but Comiskey Park had its, had its own unique kind of character. A lot of what's said in that documentary um, because it was just such a unique old ball yard and there were nooks and crannies everywhere. I mean, they talked about this last night in that documentary. They talked about the stairwell <clears throat> that led from the offices into the clubhouse. That I didn't know that. But I can tell you there were other stairwells that I knew about in that park that were really like hidden. And there were closets and all kinds of things like that. Where is it guaranteed rate field? You know, it's more of a modern building, but it's great. It's a great place to work. It's a great place to see a game. I really love working there. Um, but Comiskey, the old park, really had had a great feel to it. Just a great feel to it. Yep, absolutely. You know, and 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 at you know guaranteed rate. You know, you've seen the scoreboard evolve over the years. You know, is has is that ever kind of like I guess impacted your job over the years? Well, you know, the great thing about I often think about my father who basically was born in 1930 and he saw every wave of technology from, you know, radio until to the internet. I'm kind of the same way in the scoreboard, <clears throat> you know, scoreboard. I started on this very rudimentary uh, compositor it was called. And it was, you know, we had these huge, you know, discs that we had to back up every game or every series. And when we moved into the new park, you know, the technology kept getting faster and smaller <clears throat> so I had to learn a lot of new technology almost every year. Um, and the, and the, the board has become uh, 
yeah, I'm looking at your background there. That's mm -hmm. a small board. You know, now we have this huge uh, board now that is a lot more, you know, it's a lot easier to see, especially when you think about that. So I definitely have had to evolve uh, with the technology. And that's been one of the great things about the, the job is that it kind of keeps you young from the standpoint that, you know, <clears throat> you can't say, I don't, you know, a lot of people my age or older are like, oh, I don't, I'm not on the internet, I'm off the grid or whatever. If you want to survive in this business as an old man like me, you have to be on the grid, you have to evolve, and you have to learn new things. And <clears throat> that's been one of the great advantages of working in the scoreboard. Yep, yep, absolutely. That's a, you and you know, know what, too? The newspaper was the same way. You know, basically, when I started in the newspaper, we were still, you, you know, doing things with wax and cutting and pasting. And by the time I got to the end of it, I was designing a page on my computer. So, yeah, I basically, I've learned the technology as it's come along, and it's been very, very helpful. Yep, yep, yep of course. Yeah, just um, to survive. Yeah, right. Um, you, you know, and so we, you know, we were just talking about you know, how magical, you know, that that last season at Comiskey Park was in 1990. Well, you know, let's talk about, you know, the most magical season of 2005. You know, what was that like for you in that 05, you know, postseason, you know, with just this whole and um, just the whole city of Chicago is, is are all aboard the Sox train, you know, so much energy going around, you know, what was that like from your perspective that was an that was an unbelievably magical year obviously and <clears throat> the thing that made that year great <clears throat> same with 1990 is that it was unexpected right nobody picked the Sox to win that year and as the year got going and you know they were in first place pillar to post you could tell that team had great chemistry and they had great pitching, clutch hitting, and they had guys. I mean, they, that team had great players when you think about it. You know, Frank Thomas was on that team for a half year. Jermaine Dye, A.G. Perzinski, I mean, you name it. Um, you could just kind of tell that they were they were destined for something special. And as the year got going and they started winning more games, people started to believe. And – I remember distinctly there was a, <clears throat> a a game that they had to make up in Boston on a Monday. It was and Ed Farmer said on the radio said something to the effect of this is a one game series and we're going to come back here in the in the fall and and play one game which would be to clinch the AL division series and it happened. Um, that team was just really good and the, you know the the best thing about it for me was that I was able to experience it as a member of the scoreboard crew with a lot of talented people, many of whom are still there working. And we all got to celebrate that together. Um, we only obviously only worked the home games. I was at every, you know, at every playoff game. And I distinctly remember leaving after game two of the world series when they won that game on Scott Pesednik's walk off home run and, Paul Canerco hit the grand slam. <clears throat> I remember thinking like, I'm not, I don't want to come back because you wanted him to sweep, right? Win the two games in Houston. I don't want to work a game six, but a part of you says, yeah, you know, I do want to work a game six because I was working with all these beautiful people and that beautiful team, but they ended up winning it. And it was just fantastic. That's a long winded answer to saying like, that was an unbelievably great season. And our production on the scoreboard really matched it. And that's probably what made it as gratifying as, as anything. And, you know, funny, I'll just bore you with one quick anecdote. I remember the whole thing was really kind of a blur. That game two was just an unbelievable game. It's the best game I've ever seen of any event that I've ever been to. Uh, Burley's perfect game is close. But I remember <clears throat> watching the highlight tape, and when Pesednik hit that homer, I could see the bottom part of the stat that I had up on the board. And I thought, I'm going to slow that down and stop it. And I looked at it, and I could read what it was. And it was Pesednik's lifetime average against the pitcher, which is a very relevant stat. And when I saw that, I thought, wow, that really was a great 
moment, not only for the team, especially for the team and the fans, but in my own little world of being like the, you know, the stat guy on that, at that moment, that was a great moment for me. And I wrote about it on this huge blog on my WordPress blog. It's all there, but that's what I remember mostly about that game too, was, was just that, that, that's what I mostly remember about that world series was that second game was just off the chain. As the kids say, it was just great. So there it is. That's a long winded answer about 2005. It was fantastic. Yep. Yeah. 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 It sure was. And, and, and that's, you know, every time I watch the highlights, you know, you know, from, from that run in that world series, just the energy in that part, it's incredible. Everyone's like, you, you know, every, pretty much everyone's dressed in black. It's an intimidating, it's a very intimidating environment of for you know, the Astros. And it's, you know, it, it's it's just something special to watch, you know. You just knew after the Sox won that first game of the World Series, they were not gonna they were not gonna lose the World Series. They were gonna be world champions. Mm-hmm. And actually, my favorite moment of that or one of my favorite moments of that World Series next to game two is when Jeff Blum hit the homer in the 14th inning and in Houston in game three. And I, I contend that's the single greatest home run in White Sox history because when he hit that homer you knew the White Sox were going to win the World Series. They were going to win game three. They were going to be up three nothing, and they weren't going to lose it. And I contend that's the perfect White Sox home run because it was his only hit of the World Series. It was, his, and, and then he left. And that was it. It was, that was his last hit as a member of the White Sox. And I've had some conversations with him about it, and he's, he's been really great about it. But uh, then game three was fantastic. And then game four obviously was super. So yeah, there was just a lot of energy. And there was a lot of energy and White Sox energy in Houston that year, too. I wish I was there, but I wasn't. But um, that was basically a Sox takeover at the end. Yeah, 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 it sure was. You know, the I, you know, I think I, I think that's the thing is, is I think everyone, you know, I think when people, you know, you know think of like of like these like like, oh, you know, they always think about how great the Cubs environment is. It's like always Cubs, Cubs, Cubs. People forget how amazing White Sox fans are and how passionate they yes. get. And how just and how magical the environment is on the south side, you know. Especially, yeah. we, we saw it against the Astros in the ALDS, you know, yep. you know, just two years ago. That was really spectacular, and it's great to be a part of it. And uh, it, it is, you're right. There's a lot of electricity in that park when it gets going, and it it can really be a loud, fun place. Yep, yep, it absolutely can be. Um, you, you know, and, and so I, so I, yeah, and then I, um. I I know I know I asked you you know you know what was what's kind of the typical day like you know for you you know you know in the newsroom and stuff right you know, I'm curious for you you know what's you know what's like your kind of just game day routine like for you you know on you know on like just a typical you know game day uh I arrive I like to get to the park um maybe two hours before the gates open. <laughs> And then I basically go into game mode. I see who's pitching. I see who's batting. And I will start to prepare um, the stuff that I have to do. There's There are things that I have to do in terms of you know sponsored material I have to display or features that we run. But when we get into the um, crux of the game, yeah, before the game, I'll look at the lineup, look at the pitchers, look for matchups. Um, I'll look for... Um, uh, situational stuff that might be important and then i'll just kind of arrange how i want to um, display the stats uh, the way that we were doing it for the last couple of years is uh, the starting pitcher would go out there and we would display during the f- top of the first you know all of their stats and get through the first inning and then when the socks would come up the bat you know i would i display stats on what they're doing and very fortunate that i get to basically operate without a net, I'm trusted. Uh, the White Sox have been extremely good to me, extremely good to everyone. Uh, Jeff Chanel, my boss, as I as I've mentioned before, gives me a tremendous amount of freedom. So when a guy comes up to bat, first inning, whatever, um, you know, Abreu was great for this. There was a lot of background. Let's say they were playing the Minnesota Twins, <clears throat> and I would list um, how he's done in his career against the Twins. Then maybe I would list the White Sox all-time home run leaders 
against the twins where he would rank among there. And I would just constantly uh, display that information as the game goes on. So during the game, if you think about, you know, there are 27 outs. So how many batters there are in a game, if you multiply that by, you know, five, or, I like to get five or six stats up for each batter during a game. That's a lot of information that I'm just constantly um, putting up there. I basically operate from a base so I have I have evergreen stats that I use on players, but when the game merits it, I like to use situational stats, <clears throat> how they've done, if they're up with runners on, put that up, two outs, how, how they fare against the team. You know, even I'll go day, night, anything, you know, that, that will is relevant to the situation. Um, and then later on in the game, we display – trivia questions that I write, notes that I write that are relevant to the game. Um, and as I said, the White Sox have been really good to me in terms of just letting me kind of run wild with the kind of information that I put up there. <clears throat> you know, it'll be interesting this year, Sam, to see how that works with the pitch clock because it's going to be a lot quicker paced game. It's going to change, but there's a, all you can do is evolve and change with it because – you know, as you've seen in spring training, and I think it's been great, the games are shorter, they're they're much quicker paced. And so I think everyone in 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 baseball is gonna have to gonna have to do it. I mean, you're gonna have to come along for the ride. Jeff Passon on ESPN basically was asked, you know, these star players, they're gonna get all mad about this. And Passon said, No, it's all on the players, it's all on the people to to evolve to the pitch clock. And I think that's what we're all gonna have to do. Um, so just as the game goes on, that's what I'm doing. You know, I prepare a little bit before the game. A lot of my work is done, um, before, like right now I'm starting to input statistics and information that we'll use throughout the year. And then <clears throat> when the game starts, I'm able to, you know, adapt the stats to, to the, to the actual game. So it's, it's a lot being in journalism, uh, being working on deadline really has helped me with that. Uh, Twitter has helped me with that because I'm learned you learn to write in small, concise sentences and and nuggets. And so that's basically what I'm doing for nine innings and, and sometimes longer. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and as you said, it will definitely be interesting to kind of see how, oh. see how things change this season. It's you know, it's it, it's really <clears throat> a whole new ball game this year. It is, you know, every every day they the White Sox have played seven. Cactus League games. And I've listed the time of game from each. I've tweeted tweeted it out. And the the time compared to the those first seven games from this year and last year, unbelievably quicker. I mean, the Sox haven't had a game over 236, I think, so far. And then last year at this time, their shortest game, I think, was 250. So it's definitely, it's definitely changed. And I and I think it's going to be a lot better. You know. This is the baseball that I grew up watching in the 70s, 80s, and early 90s, where it was a lot quicker paced. Um, there was a lot more action. And I think the baseball that we've watched lately is a different kind of baseball. It's the baseball that the younger generation has come up. But the the baseball that I, you know, 230, 235, that's still, that's still a long time. And if the game is more, if the longer games have action in them, I don't think people will complain. And I think the shorter, more compact games are just going to be great. I'm really, really looking forward to it. It'll mean less information up on the scoreboard, but I'm, I'm willing to make that concession. Yep, yep, yeah. It gets funny. I, I was at the, uh, I was at the game that the Sox played against the Guardians. You know, just a couple of days ago. Yeah, yeah, and just, it just blew by. It was, it, it was, it was, it was pretty surreal almost because it was the first time I, I'd seen a game live and. When, when you're I'm telling you when you're at a game live with the pitch clock like, like it really feels like wow like, like time's going by quick yeah well you know the Sox uh, had a Mark Burley was there was their quickest worker that I ever can remember and those games were so well paced <clears throat> and I remember when you'd get to the end of those games you were like excited because you saw a, a well-paced well-played game and the 05 team played a lot of those games and so did the 1990 team so I'm really looking forward to it I'll report back to you uh, after my first game to see whether or not <laughs> how I survived it. But I, th I think we're, I think we all, you know, this business is all about adapting and surviving and, 
evolving. And I, I think it's just another chapter of that, just another, another, another opportunity to evolve. Yep, I agree. Uh, we got to talk about your amazing Twitter page, uh, Socks Nerd, and of co- course your blog as well. You know, you know, you because you're you're quite you know you're quite a prominent member of White Sox Twitter. So you know, how did that page start? That's a great question, and I'm glad you asked me. Uh, I have two daughters. Uh, one is quite cocky, and back in 2012 when Twitter was evolving, she claimed that there's no way I could ever get more Twitter followers than she could. (laughs) I said, watch me. And that's basically how it started. I went on Twitter and I I started the account. I don't don't even remember how I came up with the name Socks Nerd. My wife, who's brilliant, probably came up with it. Um, And I just basically started building a community from there. And, um, Essentially, it's an outgrowth of what I put on the scoreboard. And the blog is as well. It's it's my WordPress blog. And so essentially, they all just kind of intermingle. Um, I'm a lot more, uh, you know, the Twitter gives me, I mean, I'm doing Twitter all year round. I'm obviously not working on the scoreboard all year round. Um, but that started in 2012 and I just started building it and building it and building it. And it's basically really taken off. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm at 13,000 followers. I've kind of, I've kind of peaked there and, uh, I don't know why, um, it may have had something to do with the changes that Twitter has been going through lately and that's fine. I just take it as it comes and do it. And I just do my own thing and I just love it. I just love Twitter. It really gives me an opportunity to just kind of tweet whatever I want. I'm always very positive. I stay positive on the White Sox. I stay positive on on everything. Um, And I'm able to research things and do things. um, And it really has been a way to kind of keep myself fresh, keep replenishing myself, keep finding out new things and just doing it. And the blog is the same way. You know, the blog I think I started the blog five or six years ago and I've kind of come and gone with that. I'm more active on it now. And basically that's just a landing spot for a lot of the research that I do. I'm able to expand on it. And as I said, I use it. So I love it. I love Twitter. I hope it never goes away. And I just will continue tweeting socks nuggets for as long as I can. Well, 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 hey, that's awesome because, because I, I mean, I love the page just because, you know, I feel like every day I'm learning, you know, something new about White Sox history. So I appreciate that. And that's one of my goals. You know, um, it's kind of overwhelming to think the White Sox have been around for this is going to be their 123rd season. And there aren't many institutions in Chicago that have been around that long, that have survived that long. And that's very humbling on opening day. I always think about that, you know. Anyway, um, but you're always learning something new with something that's that that's been around that long. And you know, just as an example, last night and watching that documentary, <clears throat> I knew Jerry Krause, who built the Bulls, was a scout for the White Sox. I was not aware that I knew that he discovered Ozzie Gian, but I wasn't quite sure on how that process worked. Danny Evans, who was a an executive at the time sent Krauss out to the field to scout five shortstops. And I won't, I could probably, I could come up with some of them. Greg Gagne was one. And this was, this was before the 1985 season. This was during 1984. I assume when they were looking to find a shortstop that eventually turned out to be Ozzie Gian. Well, one of the five people that they were scouting was a guy by the name of Augie Schmidt, who's a baseball coach here in Carthage college. Um, and I never knew that. And I, so last night I learned something that I, about something that I thought I knew everything about. And that's just one of the wonderful things about the Sox and learning about the Sox. And maybe someday I'll put out a book about all of those hidden gems that I found about the White Sox, you know, uh, stuff about Archie Manning, who coached or quarterback, the, uh, you know, Peyton and Eli's dad, he was drafted by the Sox. Um, There's a great story about Babe Ruth uh, chasing a dog off the field and, and, (laughs) fielding a ball barehanded and just all those kind of quirky stuff that you do stuff that you find out researching um, the White Sox, who've just been an institution for a hundred and 
23 years and and it's just really really fascinating it's just a, it's just great and you know i would tell anyone you know the socks that was the subject that i love you know if you like anything else just find that subject and twitter just gives you a great platform to just, just to go nuts and do anything you want and you know you can get information research information from your local public library i mean that's how that's you know i'm online with libraries that you get for free and that's how i get a lot of my information you just got to know where to look yeah, and you yeah. got to be a crazy twitter tweeter like me <laughs> i love to tweet <laughs> Oh, yep, yep, yep. Uh, well, well, like I can, I, I can relate to you on that, baby, because I love Twitter as well. You know, it's, I it's do. A great, it, it really is a great platform to, to, to like, you know, to, to get your name out there, you, you, you know, and really kind of, really kind of build, you know, as, as, as they say, you know, in my journalism classes, like, like build a brand for yourself. That's exactly right. And I, and I did that uh, unintentionally. I think I just, you know, as I said, I first used it to show my daughter that I could get that I could get more followers than her. And I did, you know, within like a day, but uh, I, it's not like I bring that up to her all the time, but I do. <laughs> um, and, but I, but yeah, I built a brand and it's, it was quite unintentional, but it's just because I have this information and this, and, and what I like to think is just enthusiasm for the white Sox, And I stay positive and I, I don't go, I don't partake in the, the drama that sometimes accompanies uh, social media on <clears throat> White Sox Twitter, and I just try to stay positive and present information that I think is is really interesting, and it and has really kind of opened up. Yeah, it, it. I guess you could say I have built a brand, and that's a great way to put it. And I would just encourage anyone who has a passion, whether it's baseball or music or whatever, you can you can do that on Twitter. I you know it's it's great. I. You know, I tweet a lot about Marquette basketball on another account and yeah, it hasn't taken off, but it's something that I do. And, you know, it's 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 one of my passions that I've that I've channeled through Twitter. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I got to ask you, you, you know, just in your opinion, you know, is this kind of we've been talking, you know, throughout this, you know, what in your opinion makes White Sox fans and the culture surrounding the team so unique and so special they're just we're all just dedicated you know we love the white Sox. we've seen it all we've seen the lowest of the low and the highest of the high and i think through it all they just stay loyal and they fight through it and they stick with it and it's a great it's a great bonding experience I found on Twitter. You know, you also learn a lot about people like what, what makes people, um, what makes people, you know, angry about the socks or happy about the socks. But I think in general, you know, you know, us against them is like one of the most tired cliches in sports. Like when that Kansas city tight end used it after they won the super bowl, you know, no, buddy everyone knew you were going to win the super bowl okay <laughs> everyone believed in you but with the white Sox, it's such a small um sliver of like fans and fan bases i think there's just kind of that that pride of being part of the white Sox that that really drives the whole thing and i find that you find that on twitter i find that at the park people just love it and you know um they're just a loyal passionate enthusiastic group of fans and fun they're fun you know white Sox twitter i'm sure you found it's a lot of fun it's just great and being at the ballpark is fun and watching the games on tv is fun and talking about it is fun and again the fact that there's 123 years of information to draw from really really helps really really helps i mean you can relate to anything you the white Sox have seen it all Yep, yep, they sure have, and and I would say that the White Sox have have one of the most unique histories out of just any professional sports franchise. It is it is really unbelievable when you think like they started in 1901, they built their own park. You know the, that park was so unique. I mean, it had a bottling plant in it. And it was built on a garbage dump, and they put a second deck on it. Then the you know then they added this exploding scoreboard. And then they moved into the new park and 
you know, there was the Black Sox scandal. Then from then they were really good from like 51 to 67. They never finished below 500. They were in the first division the whole time. They were really a great team. The only thing that kept them from being a dynasty was the great New York Yankees. And then, you know, they, they've just had a lot of players that have been very, um, been characters. They've had Minnie Minoso, serialist Joe Jackson, and Dick Allen. I'm sure you saw on that documentary last night, what an unbelievable uh, figure Dick Allen was. And then Frank Thomas came along and, and then, the, you know, the fans just really relate to guys like Mark Burley and Paul Canerco. And then you think about guys and in, in, uh, like Maglio Ordonez and, and Robin Ventura, guys who don't get a lot of, you don't remember them a lot as players. One of my favorite players of all time was a guy by the name of Ray Durham. He was a second baseman. I loved him. He was fast. He was a switch hitter. He was great. Um, so this team has really had a unique history. And I think that's been one of the... Uh, one of the things that's attracted me to this Twitter and, and blog that I have. Yep. Yep. Definitely. I, I definitely agree with you there. Uh, my last question is, you know, just what is your outlook on this upcoming 2023 20, uh, White Sox season? Well, it's going to go a lot quicker. <laughs> Number one, right. Oh, oh, yeah. uh, I, I'm really excited to see how the team does with everyone in place, right? Like when you go around the diamond, everyone on that team was injured or, or had some sort of problem last year. And I think I think what we all want to see is how this team fares when everyone's healthy, <clears throat> playing a, you know, like playing the same position in the same spot in the lineup for 162 games just to see how that team fares. And I think, you know, when you look at that, when you look at the roster, there's a lot of talent on that team. I think I saw in the athletic the other day that um, Andrew Vaughn and Luis Robert are predicted as like big breakout hitters this year. Well, you know, they're great hitters. I mean, they're not here by accident and, you know, Moncada, let's get him healthy and see how he does. Tim was in, Tim Anderson was injured last year. Second base. They've got a, you know, they've got Elvis Andrews back. Um, you know, he was, he was solid. He's never played, never played a big league game at second base. Um, but that's where, you know, he's going to, and their first base, Andrew Vaughn. Um, and then, you know, in the outfield, Eloy, and you know, you just want to get everyone healthy, everyone in the St. Grandal hit a homer today. So hopefully he's coming along. You get everyone healthy, you get everyone working together. I, I think the team has a lot of talent and I, I think they could contend for the central division title. That's, but you know, I'm Mr. Optimistic, Mr. Enthusiasm, but, you know, looking at the talent on that team, there's just no way that they're, they're not, they're not one of the best teams in that division. Yeah. 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 I definitely agree with you. And, and I think the, like, 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 and, and obviously, you know, last year, you know, no, it was, it was a tough season, you know, it they just didn't, didn't quite meet expectations, but, but, but as you said, you know, there's a lot of injuries and stuff and, 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 and I'm really also excited to so see how the, how the new manager does. I, I, I'm really, you know, from what I've seen out of him, I'm really liking uh, Pedro a lot so far. Yeah. He's young and he's enthusiastic and, uh, and he, he, he's preaching accountability, which is great. They're going to have to overcome the unfortunate uh, circumstance of Liam Hendricks, but I'm confident that Ronaldo Lopez, uh, or whoever they put in there will, will, um, will be able to fill that, fill that void. And, there's some stats on my blog that I kind of bro broke down on Lopez. He's very good in the ninth inning and there's some very good in some, some situations where if he gets an ex how it'll be interesting to see how he does with a expanded sample size. So um, that that's tough. Liam Hendricks, that's tough. I mean, he's, he was just such a great part of this and um, you know, hopefully he comes back, uh, but it'll be interesting to see how Ronaldo Lopez or whomever they put in that closer spot will do yeah definitely and then i'm also excited for for ben and tendy uh you know the big big signing in the off season yeah it'll be interesting to see how he does um you know he, he again he's a guy who like he'll just be out there every day uh hopefully he'll be hitting in the same couple of spots in the order um he'll be exciting to watch there's no question about it and um you know he was the big guy they got in the off season so we'll see how he does Yep, definitely. But 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 I but I agree with you, man. I think it's going to be a 
I, I think it's definitely going to be a bounce back season. I think so. Time. I think when they get everyone healthy, um, playing in their roles, it'll it'll be interesting. It, there's just a lot of talent there. Yep, yep, there definitely is. Uh, yeah, that. Hey, that's all the questions I have, Dave. Uh, gosh, like, thank you so much for 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 letting me speak with you today. Truly, truly, an honor. No problem. Well, I appreciate that. That's I appreciate that. And if there's anything else you need, let me know. Hey, hey, hey of course, Dave. And you, you know, of course, uh, you know, you know. Good luck with this season, man. I, you know, I can't can't wait to see all the great stuff you're uh, putting up on the scoreboard. I can't wait either and stay in touch. Okay. Yes, absolutely, man. You have a good, good night. I hope you have a great rest of a great rest of your night, man. You too. Take care. You too. Take care, man. <laughs>